So now we're going to look at scheduling because we've uh, looked into tasks and we know that we can sort of create work packets from code and put them into you know, these tasks or threads and then we want to run them uh, concurrently on a system. And so how we decide or how the system decides which tasks to run and when and to when to perform these context switches and is in control of all of this, this is done by what's called the scheduler, which I've mentioned is a very key part of any kernel or for instance, uh, free RTOS, which is in a way just a kernel. So like scheduling is the one that's responsible for, or the scheduler is responsible for um, yeah, the CPU and using context switches to decide what code is run at what point in time, right? And so, as you can imagine, there's no one way of doing this. There's lots of different ways of deciding how what runs when and how you calculate priorities or sort of um, when to schedule or allocate certain resources, certain tasks. And this is obviously is an active research field and a long-standing um, part of operating system design. So, um, there's policies, which is a way of saying sort of. Um, abstractly, this is the logic that my system uses to determine um, what task is going to run and when. So FreeRTOS has its own policy. You can really implement your own policy in FreeRTOS. Um, but then when you get into more complex schedulers, such as in the Linux kernel, where there are some available, like some existing ones, such as the completely fair scheduling or scheduler, there are lots and lots of different options and um, the user can either configure them, add their own. And so there's a, there's a lot of like design space to explore when talking about the, um, the scheduling policy. But there are a few common ones and we'll be looking at some basic ones because free Artos's scheduler is also quite simple. Um, and we'll get to a bit more in depth about some of the more advanced topics of scheduling later in the course. Now we're going to keep it sort of abstract and look more so at the implementation side of things as we're looking more so at using free RTOS and just the practical use of the scheduler rather than the in-depth sort of timing analysis that comes behind um, scheduling and scheduling policy evaluation and whatnot. So there, um, to, before we quickly talk about free RTOS um, here and its priorities, I'll just mention that the, the, like for instance, one good example of a scheduling policy or a scheduler is the one that's used in the Linux kernel. And it's called, the, it's CFS, which stands for the Completely Fair Scheduling Algorithm, but known commonly as a Completely Fair Scheduler. And so what it tries to do is it's trying, because my computer is not a real-time system in that it doesn't say, hey, this is more important than this. Like it doesn't know that my email program or it doesn't, think that my email program is more important than my um, like PDF viewer. So it's not scheduling the CPU or allocating the CPU um, to this sort of like what's important and what's not. There's no hard root deadlines or soft deadlines. It sort of just wants all of my programs, which it doesn't know anything about to run. So it's saying, hey, yeah, Alex on his laptop wants his network manager to run and he also wants his PDF manager to run. Really like the at the moment, since I'm giving a lecture, my PDF is more important. I don't need my internet connection, but my scheduler doesn't know this. It just wants to be completely fair, hence its name, and it sort of makes sure that every process on my laptop gets a chance to run. Because if it doesn't, then you get into these problems like on such older systems when we didn't have such um, competent schedulers where some programs would just start to freeze. And this could not. This might not even be a problem with the program and its code. This could be just a pro problem with the the scheduling in the kernel. In that the program is getting what we would call starved, meaning it's not getting any CPU time, which causes the program to hang or to freeze, right? Because it's not running. Um, it's just sitting uh, in a block state off of the CPU. And so that's one approach to. Um, to scheduling is that you want to sort of say, okay, cool, we want to ensure that every process is given an equal amount of CPU time. But now this leads to the problem in that we don't really have much input or as like a user for sort of um, safety critical or hard real-time systems where we say, no, this is the important task and we want this one to run before this one, right? And so um, the completely fair scheduler uses priorities, but these are done by calculating dynamic priorities um, using like the sort of the execution time or the amount of time that the, the, the task has had on the CPU. Whereas in free RTOS, we are doing it a more manual way in that we provide, we the user provide priorities to our tasks and we can sit down on a piece of paper and plan out our software and say, yep, this is my most important task. I'll give it the highest priority. 
Then after that one's done, I need this to run. I'll give that the second highest priority. And then you can sort of keep going down or maybe you have two tasks that are equally as important and you can put them in the same priority. And so this is how we have this um, user assigned priorities that help us determine uh, how our system is going to execute or how our task will get scheduled onto the CPU. So I'm quickly missing something on this screen. Yeah, so um, there's a few sort of key words that we want to talk about when we talk about scheduling policies and preemptive is probably one of the key words or concepts to understand when it comes to scheduling and priorities. And so the idea of preemption as it's sort of, I mean, the word itself, preempting something means to sort of like to interrupt or to like, if I was to preempt someone talking, I would sort of just interrupt them and talk, right? Um, and so this means very much the same thing when it comes to scheduling and task execution in the tasks um, can pre when a system is preemptive, what you're saying is that uh, if a task with a higher priority comes along, it can stop something that's less important than itself, meaning a task of less priority, lesser priority, and it can run. So this is a way that a system says, okay, I'm structured in a way that I will allow tasks to interrupt other ones before they finish executing. So a non-preemptive system means that a task that's running on the CPU has to finish executing and essentially manually surrender control of the CPU. Whereas a preemptive system means that the scheduler can decide if a task should be sort of interrupted and another task should run. And so in free RTOS, this is explicitly used for um, the preemption of lower priority tasks with high priority tasks. So this is how we sort of, um, we don't always guarantee, but we can sort of help to um, ensure in a way that a high, the high priority tasks will get given the CPU time they need because they won't be interrupted or they won't be um, delayed by lower priority tasks because this, if the high priority task says, hey, I'm ready, the scheduler will say, okay, cool, lower priority tasks are on the CPU, but we're a preemptive system, so I'll just tell it to, like, I'll just switch it off the CPU and give the time needed to this high priority task, right? And so cooperative is another name for non-preemptive, or I guess it's a sort of a different way of defining it. And so the cooperative is really this, what I was saying is that a task um, will run until completion, right? And so only when it's finished that we'll, we'll surrender the CPU. And now obviously there are a lot of different sort of ways and we can sort of mix these two up and have like a, what we call like a hybrid scheduling policy. But this sort of key concepts when we're talking about scheduling, and I'll probably use the word preemption a lot, is that that we should sort of be aware of is that there's this sort of um, interruption of currently executing tasks with higher priority or some other task that meets some sort of criteria that means that they should be running, right? Um, then we get to sort of like how we decide what tasks to run. And so like, for instance, um, priority based is one way. And for another way would be round robin where we sort of like either we randomly pick the tasks that we run or we just run them in an order. And so, um, when it comes to free RTOS, it actually runs a slightly, uh, well, it has sort of two steps to its um, scheduling policy, which we'll see in a second. And that is that it runs, it's a preemptive system, meaning it'll run the highest priorities and then the second and the third. So it runs just the highest priorities. And then within each priority, it runs them in a list form because as the tasks are created, they're pushed onto a list and then it'll just execute through that list. And so there'll be, I'll show a figure in a second, which will sort of outline this. But one thing I should quickly note uh, or should sort of show before um, we go into it, and I think I mentioned this in my last de um, practical example, is that the scheduler is uh, in free arts, so is called using this VTAS start scheduler. And so this start scheduler actually invokes the functionality of the scheduler and gets the whole free artist kernel in a way sort of running, right? But if we look at the scheduling, or if you want to represent the scheduling logic or policy in free RTOS in a figure, then we can see um, we have this sort of like double list in that we have our priority levels. And then within each priority, we have a list of tasks. And so if this was my code, task one and two would both have been created with a maximum priority using VTask create. But task one would have been created before task two. And this is because the free RTOS's data structure within the scheduler for keeping track of this task, it keeps for each priority level a list. And so as you can imagine, as tasks are created, they're put onto this list. And so 
when it wants to run a tar uh, like the highest priority, it doesn't know which one of the highest priorities to run, so it's going to run them in the order that were created. And this is a sort of characteristic of the free RTOS scheduler. So then I was mentioning, I think before, about the sort of sys tick that we get given in free RTOS, and then it's this um, this interrupt that actually invokes the scheduler periodically to sort of allow for context switching, which is what gives us this pseudo parallel execution of tasks, as I was explaining that we have this sort of task execution. But where we, when we talk about um, the actual sys tick, I think I want to reiterate how it's provided, given that it is very much, a, it's a hardware, I mean, sorry, it's an embedded system hardware sort of a problem or a solution. And because we're looking at embedded systems, I think it'd be really good to outline this. And so, um, on a embedded system, on pretty much all embedded systems or ARM, whatever, 32-bit microcontrollers or even older um, Atmel sort of 8-bit controllers is a very standard peripheral is that you have a peripheral on, this, on the, um, the MPU called a, uh, a, um, a hardware timer or a timer, right? And the timer is um, essentially a counter in that this, the, um, the clock of the system, of the chip, is fed into this timer and the timer counts. But you can configure this timer through configuration registers and whatnot to have certain values. And so the timer's basic functionality is that you can, you'll load it with a value and the clock will be fed to the timer so it'll clock, clock, clock and count up. So if you have like a 72 megahertz microcontroller, this means that this timer will count to 72 million per second so if you wanted a one second tick, you would configure the time and it counts to 72 million. And then every time that this um, value is reached, depending on the configuration, but normally you configure it to sort of reset and to count again. So you just get it, it just counts up to 72 million and then resets, counts back up, counts back up. But when this value is reached through, um, a, it's called a capture and compare register, meaning that the value in the timer is looked at compared to a value, so this is how we actually count to the 72 2 million, you can configure this, um, this capture and compare to generate hardware interrupts. And so a hardware interrupt is just a signal that gets sent to the um, processor, and this is this IRQ here, as you can see in the figure. So this hardware timer is configured. We're not really gonna look into the configuration or the, like the really low level use of these timers, but we're just gonna say, yes, we have a timer peripheral. We configure it to count to a certain number, for us, we want it to count at a cer certain frequency with a certain period, and then it will generate this IRQ. And so what this really is, is a, it's an interrupt request. And so the processor will have a, also has another peripheral called the NVIC. And so this is the ne N NVIC nested vector interrupt controller. And essentially what this is, is that you can have, the processor has interrupts that can come from all different places, from different peripherals, from your communications, from the screen, like touch screens, from buttons, from like GPIO pins, from all over. And so one of the lines that it can get its interrupt from will be from this hardware timer. And so this, this NVIC is essentially just a list, like a vector of interrupt lines that can be possibly fired. And its job is to sort of check which one it was and then to run the appropriate code. And so how compilation, it, when it comes to interrupts works, is that a certain system, like a, with a certain compiler, will be set up so that a certain function, like a, name, a function with a certain name, is bound to a certain interrupt. So that when, you, for instance, your, your interrupt from your timer comes in, you'll trigger the, the, the call of a, this timer interrupt service routine, which has a certain name, right? And so this, this, inter this interrupt routine that we get triggered from our, um, from our IRQ, we can then set up to trigger our tick for our sys tick, meaning that every time this hardware timer hits its value, like for instance, a tick every second, meaning it hits 72 million, it will trigger uh, an interrupt service routine, which has a specific name. And then this in this service routine, which we as the programmers can program, we get it to call the sys tick, essentially called the scheduler, right? And so in free RTOS, this is handled usually for you on this sort of, there's these port files that handle the system relevant implementation. And for like, for instance, a STM32, like a 32-bit STM microcontroller on a Cortex-M4, 
the hardware peripherals have a certain name, but the port files will have that name implemented for you, that function, and in that function, they will implement a call to the FreeArts scheduler. And so that's how we get this um, periodic invocation of the scheduler from a hardware um, peripheral. And this is really useful because it actually doesn't depend on what the CPU is doing. The CPU's clock is fed from the CPU, like from the crystal on the board to the peripheral, because it's also fed to the CPU, but the CPU's actual, like what the CPU is doing doesn't impact this timer, meaning that if the CPU is really busy or something, it's not actually gonna delay the counting and the timer. The timing in this hardware timer is gonna always happen. And this is some sort of way that we can guarantee that we're going to get this, this periodic interrupt. And because of how interrupts work with normal code execution, interrupts uh, on most standard systems will actually stop the execution of the code on the CPU and call these interrupt service routines. So it sort of, in a way, preempts the CPU to force it to run these interrupt service routines, meaning it sort of forces the execution of the scheduler given this interrupt signal that we periodically generate, right? So then, a common question that I get answered by my um, students is that, okay, we have this periodic execution of the SysTick, but what happens if I have multiple tasks? I, I want to create four tasks and I want them all to run uh, like every tick, but I want them to be scheduled in their orders given their priority. So like, how does this happen? If the scheduler is only called once every tick, how does this happen? And so a way to think about it is that scheduling in, Len uh, not in Linux in FreeRTOS doesn't necessarily determine the order of execution, it just determines the next task to run. And so when the tick is invoked, like the sys tick, it will check essentially for all of these sort of conditional statements, like these blocking on these task delays, as we can see, um, do we have anyone here? This V task delay, this call here, will actually delay a task. And so th the sys tick does these checks and then sort of all it determines is, hey, should I move tasks from blocked to ready? And so the SysTick scheduler um, invokes these sort of this, this checking of, of um, yeah, like delays, blocking functionalities and moves tasks to their appropriate states. But then all it, and then how execution continues is that the, the, the scheduler will then invoke the top priority uh, first task, like the, the next task to run, which it does by going through this list and going highest priority, checking, 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 and then taking the first like the sequentially the highest priority task to execute. And then after these tasks run, if they have, like they like all tasks should have, some sort of a blocking statement, you know, like a delay or it's waiting for a, a semaphore or some sort of a signal, this blocking, as we can see in here, like if a task actually is blocking using VTask delay, it will um, call this port yield within API. And what this is, is that this is a context switch. This macro, port yield within an API, will actually call a function that is then specified in the port file, meaning the board specific implementation, to perform a context switch. So the scheduler doesn't say, I want to run this task, this task, this task. It says, okay, we're going to check all of the tasks and we'll put them in their appropriate states. So we all the tasks that were blocked on some signal or blocked waiting for a certain time and we've achieved that time will now go back to ready and then we'll take the first task and we'll schedule it. And then when that task reaches some point where it blocks again, it will then pick the next task and then run that. But this periodic checking of blocking events, this happens with the SysTick. And so there is a um, sort of slight difference, but the sequential or this sort of like why we can get multiple tick tasks to execute within a tick is that every time a task that has control of the CPU blocks, it'll invoke a context switch and this sorry, I'm not directly a context switch, but it will re-invoke um, the scheduler in a way that it evaluates what's the next task to execute and it will context switch this task onto the CPU, right? And so um, we saw this before, this exactly sort of um, this, this sort of figure, but what happens is that for instance, we have um, like, we can think of these for instance, not as ticks really, but as sort of context switches. And so they don't have to necessarily be ticks, but if these are sort of blocking events that somewhere in here will be actual calls to reevaluate all of the blocking events, right? 
So a few more things that we sort of want to talk about quickly is that we have um, a few different parameters that we can change in that we can sort of, we can adjust this tick length like to be a certain sort of time because by default for free RTOS it's generally a millisecond. But you can imagine that there's sort of like a trade-off, like the more often the scheduler is called, the sort of the higher the overhead of actually executing the scheduler's code will be. Because if you execute like every nanosecond, you'll probably spend most of your time just running scheduler code than actually running task code. But if you, re if you run the, the scheduler like every second, then you, for instance, tasks are always going to block for like the, the smallest time frame to block is a second, meaning that their responsiveness is quite slow. Like if some event happens between these seconds, the scheduler isn't called to actually unblock them or change their states. So we, we sort of get a decreased responsiveness of our system. So it's always this trade-off between responsiveness and sort of uh, overhead in our um, scheduler. So I think we've, we've sort of gone through this when we're talking about context switches, but now there's a sort of a use one useful um, thing that we can talk about in that is the kernel tick is here, for instance, these dotted lines. And every time the kernel is, uh, the sys tick is called, sort of invoked, we'll call the schedule and it'll reevaluate. And then sort of here we can see we have the idle task, a sys tick happens, um, the scheduler is, in call, is invoked, but obviously at this point in time, nothing is ready to run, so the idle task starts running up again. We'll get some interrupt, meaning some sort of a external input, and this obviously from this diagram is saying, hey, I want to run this, this application task. So this interrupt has then triggered the scheduler again, and it's running then some code. And so this code finishes running, and when it finishes running, it's sort of blocking on something, and this is going to cause the scheduler to be invoked. And so this is going to then go back and then obviously if there's nothing else to be run, it'll go back to the idle task and keep running. But we'll see here that we have this periodic execution of the scheduler. And so you can imagine that on some systems, like systems that can go to sleep, like these really low power um, in microcontrollers, they will, this means that they have to constantly do this work and come out of their sleep state. So for super low power devices, this means that they have to leave their super low power states. So this, for instance, is one problem is that you have this unnecessary code execution. But then you can sort of structure your kernel in what we call a tickless kernel in that the scheduler's execution is not actually done periodic using a sysTick. We sort of remove the sysTick. So here we can actually see it. We have these dashed lines, but it's not actually doing anything. It's not calling, invoking the scheduler. And so in a system that's configured to be tickless, what it's, what, how we use the system or how we actually use multiple tasks is that it's up to the developer, the, like the engineer, to manually invoke the scheduler and to guarantee that they are, or to, to be responsible for making sure that the scheduler is invoked when it's necessary to, to, to decide when other tasks should be running. And so we can see here, the interrupt comes in like normal, uh, like same as in this kernel tick diagram, and it invokes the scheduler, which then executes the application code and then calls the scheduler again. And now in this case, what is happening is that we've taken the, the actual invocation of the scheduler um, only as it's no longer in the sysTick and in the interrupt, it's only in the interrupt. And this interrupt is not the same interrupt as the sysTick, but it could be for instance, a from a GPO um, interrupt, meaning when a button is pressed. And so the usefulness of this in some sort of super low power system is that the system is only sort of woken up to do work when an actual external interrupt happens, such as when someone presses a button. If you're not pressing a button, then the system can go into its super low power sleep and it won't get interrupted by this periodic execution of the scheduler. And so this is sort of one structure that you can have to your sort of um, real-time operating system for low power applications, uh, or if it's sort of useful to you to just not have this periodic invocation of the scheduler because then it completely removes this overhead, for instance, um, and it can be beneficial. So um, this is what I have in this last point here. But then also one thing I sort of want to um, touch on, although we won't really look at it in this course because looking going into interrupt handlers is sort of a, a somewhat of an advanced embedded systems um, topic and something that we won't touch on really, like the actual implementation of them is that interrupt handlers in execute in what we will call an interrupt context. And so these also exist in the Linux kernel where my hardware peripheral is triggering some sort of interrupts through the device drivers. The, the CPU executes in what we would call then a different context. And so 
the context in this case, we're saying it sort of executes in a privileged state in that the interrupt is treated as more important than that code that was executing before that. And so, as you can imagine, then an interrupt comes in, whatever is in the interrupt handler is going to execute before control is given back to the CPU uh, or to the code that was executing before, which we can sort of think of is under the control of the scheduler because the interrupt gets executed whenever this interrupt signal is generated on a hardware level, meaning the scheduler has no impact on when this code is run. And so therefore things such as priorities and all of this sort of um, this uh, policy that you've built up to actually decide when things are going to get run is not being used and it's not being adhered to. And so this is a risk that we run for um, running interrupt code is that it runs in a, in a context that doesn't actually use the policies or the scheduling policies that we've generated. And so it runs in a, and, and this is why we say it runs in a privileged context, meaning that it runs irrespective or irrelevant to what is currently executing on the system. And therefore you can imagine that if you're putting large amounts of code or work into the interrupt handlers, you might be sort of uh, working against the whole con or the whole paradigm of your system in that you wanted to work with these priorities and to sort of um, be able to schedule when certain things should be done. And so um, here, uh, sorry, and what, so therefore what I wanted to sort of, or the concept that I want to say when we're dealing with interrupts and just a general idea to have in your head is that when you're creating a system with interrupts, you want to try and maybe put as little work in them as possible such as if we had a system where a button is pressed and it triggers an interrupt, in the interrupt you just say, you set a flag to say that the button has been pressed and then you can return out of the interrupt handler and you can then let your scheduler decide, um, okay, maybe sh like when it's, when it's appropriate, I'm gonna run a task that checks to see if a button flag was set and if it was, it'll run the button code. And But this has the advantage in that your actual button running code is no longer run in the interrupt handler, but it's run in your normal context when the sort of execution time or the priority is determined by the scheduler. And so therefore you've sort of spent as little time as possible in this privileged interrupt execution um, state, and you're going back into executing in um, the sort of normal execution state, where, which is dictated by the scheduler. And so your scheduling policy is adhered to as much as possible. Right? So then before I jump into um, like sort of an example of the scheduler, the, there's a few things that we sort of just, I think the first point here should be sort of um, obvious in that on a given core of a processor, only one task can be executed. This sort of makes sense, right? I mean, you only have one, um, one sort of set of registers and program counter and stuff. And so then the the scheduler goes through this list, which we saw in the figure, and it takes the earliest run um, um, task that's in the ready state and puts it into the running state. And so that when this context switch happens, these running state tasks are chosen from to run. And then these tasks will run until they enter a block state. And so these block tasks will then wait until a certain event happens and the scheduler will evaluate these events and then put them into the ready state when these events happen, right? And so these events can be, for instance, temporal events, such as these, um, these delay events where they say, wait until 10, 10 ticks from now, or wait until some sort of certain, like, like a specific tick number. Or then there can be, for instance, um, synchronization events. And so these, which we'll get to a bit later, can be such as um, task notifications, queues, uh, and semaphores. And so we'll see these when we talk about these more in depth. But these are sort of ways that one task can say to another, hey, I'm done, you start now. And so the task that's going to start was blocked waiting for this signal. And so this is also something that's reevaluated by the scheduler to put them into the running state. So I think on that note, I'm going to do a quick example of the scheduler.